to week nine of our study in understanding violence in families. This particular week we're looking at chapter eight in the Barnett text uh, regarding intimate partner violence and its consequences. Intimate partner violence, IPV, is more commonly referred to as domestic violence in the community and life around you. But uh, as we have been talking about at different points during the semester, words and labels sometimes uh, have implications that may be unintended, maybe not, but nonetheless very real implications as to things like responsibility. Domestic violence, um, uh, women in uh, at least who write the feminist writers will tell you they believe that domestic violence is a very vanilla kind of a term that reduces the seriousness that waters down the seriousness of what happens that it isn't something as sweet as domestic violence uh, and, and that's the wrong term to use but but um, the, the concept of domestic violence is kind of clinical and easy to con conceptualize and to deal with wife beating or woman battering isn't so easy to swallow and it is something that is more difficult to, to conceptualize but that is they say exactly what it is and so in any event intimate partner violence I believe is is probably a more technical term and and, uh, and so on the one hand it probably doesn't doesn't address that particular issue but it does at least move us away from sort of the more bland kind of description of domestic violence which really doesn't describe what this is all about. There's nothing domestic about wife beating. So in any event, this, this lecture will be in two parts again this week. And uh, uh, the first part, uh, we'll be looking at uh, a little bit about explaining domestic partner, intimate partner violence, rather, and, and uh, talking about its consequences. Barnett has a couple of uh, things to say about this, Barnett and her associates, and uh, it should be clear from previous discussions that although both males and females are sometimes violent, women are more likely than men to be victims of injurious abuse and homicide. This uh, addresses the question and debate about whether or not male males are as victimized in domestic violence situations as are females. Uh, feminist thinkers say that this press to to include males and to give them equal standing, let's say, in the in the study of, of family violence and intimate partner violence, minimizes its impact upon women, um, and is another effort, another movement by the patriarchy, the patriarchal structure of our society, um, to to really keep domestic violence, to keep intimate partner violence, to keep wife beating under the carpet and out of our consciousness and as long as that is kept there then nothing changes and patriarchy continues and men continue to have this particular privilege to uh, domineer and and abuse individuals wives and children um, this privilege continues and so this discussion about males and females and victims we're going to touch a little bit on a, a slide very late in this particular presentation about male victims, but uh, this is primarily talking about female victims of male to female interpersonal violence. And this is why, because victim, female victims really are the ones who by far suffer the most injury and damage and are at the most disadvantage after a violent relationship, or a violent episode I should say. Battered women experience many other adverse incidents that compound their misery. One wounding outcome with very negative consequences is the tendency of others to blame survivors of male to female intimate partner violence. Everyone is ready, if not eager, to place the blame for being in a violent relationship on battered women. That, that is the nature of patriarchy. First, some statistics about domestic violence and are not in the textbook, and um, th these are relatively f uh, recent, uh, the last few years at least, provided by the Lee Shore Center in Kenai, Alaska. There may be some um, tweaks that, that could occur with these numbers uh, if a more recent uh, study or survey has been done, but uh, this is essentially, these are the facts. A woman is battered every nine seconds in the United States. Domestic violence is a leading cause of injury to women aged 15 to 44 in the United States. That means that, that women are injured more by domestic violence incidents than they are in accidents and other things that, that might injure a, a person in this age range. More than three women are murdered by a male intimate partner in the United States every day. 
Almost half of the perpetrators of domestic violence homicides have no criminal record involving violence prior to that time. And again, almost half of domestic violence homicides occur within one month of separation. When we talk about why she doesn't leave, this is one of those things you want to keep in mind. Homicides, almost half of them occur within a month after the victim has left the perpetrator. Some of those, however, take place years later, and that is one of the more compelling um, injuries that occurs in domestic violence is that the victim is never really free of fear of what might happen at the hands of the abuser. Battered women with children who seek protection orders are at four times the risk of abuse as are those who do not have children. That, that uh, connection through kids has a way of, of heightening the the severity and seriousness of the of the abuse ties people together more uh, seri uh, ties them together and uh, gives the perpetrator yet another way to abuse the um, the victim one in five women will seek medical care because of injuries or problems caused by domestic violence and women who leave their batterers are at 75 percent greater risk of being killed by the batterer than are those who stay this is a key point to understand when you try to conceptualize the reasons an individual has for staying in a battering relationship. On one level, maybe not a conscious um, intellectual level, but on one level or another it is believed, victims know this. They know that leaving will put them at greater risk than staying, even though they're being injured by staying. There are all sorts of elements of blame in the world around the victim, the domestic violence victim, the intimate partner violence victim, and, and I wanted to talk a little bit about those. Uh, first, blaming by the partner in a patriarchal society. Men are entitled and uh, should be able to come home to his castle at night and find things in perfect order. The kids well behaved, um, the wife very solicitous, dinner cooking, perfect um, Perhaps she's in a dress and high heels, and um, she somehow has managed to uh, ferret the children off, and so they're not troublesome for the rest of the evening. And um, it's going to be just an evening of romance between the two of them, or really not romance, but sex is really what he's going to be looking for, probably, in his sense of entitlement. And so this is kind of the the scenario, the picture that uh, I mean do men really come home at night you know expecting this for the most part probably not but that is the the picture i think that traditional patriarchy puts in place and sometimes men compare what they have to this and and um well they don't get that of course and so but that's that's what patriarchy does and so Part, perpetrators will hold their female partner responsible for their own abusive behaviors. Uh, why wasn't the towel hung upright? Why wasn't the house clean? What is it? What what is it? This puppy's peeing on the carpet again. The kids are screaming. They're not getting their homework done. The kid has a bad grade on his report card. All of these are her fault. She is responsible. And and mind you, in traditional female socialization in a society in our culture, we hold women responsible for the emotional nurturance of the family, keeping everybody happy. And so it is both traditional male and female socialization that sets this up. Society blames the victim. More than 40% of those surveyed believe that women are partly responsible, partly to blame for the assaults that happen to them. And more than 60% believes that if, if she was really afraid, she'd leave. They have no concept, no idea of why it is that she doesn't go. And so if she gets abused more, it's really it's her responsibility. It's her fault. Um, and, and those women who are non-traditional in, in regards to gender roles seem to be blamed more, in, according to some surveys at least. In other words, um, that if they're so independent that, they, that they're that they not the, uh, the, the little housekeeper or whatever like this, then they should stand on their own two feet more. Professionals, unfortunately, buy into this, and this can have very, very... Uh, profound impact upon upon their treatment and on, on victims willingness to seek treatment in fact um, the the concept of putting battering into the con into the context of a family conflict model or family systems model distributes partial responsibility onto the victim and, and even to the children in the family um, and and while the family systems model may be an effective and valid um, approach in working with families with some situations this is not a 
this is not a model that that uh, should be used with with in violent relationships. There, the uh, power differential is 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 very very different than it is in most families in the, in this uh, in the in the violent home, and and so professionals who use that model a lot of times uh, redistribute and, and take some of the responsibility off of the perpetrator. Interestingly, even women shelter workers, uh, only 37% of shelter workers in a 1993 survey held the batterer completely responsible for the abuse. Just over a third held the batterer completely responsible. Uh, now, granted, this is 20 years ago, and I'm hoping that, that uh, we're more enlightened, and particularly shelter workers are more enlightened than this, but still, this isn't that long ago. And, and that's... Um, it's kind of shocking, really, when you think about this. This is the place where women go to get away from abuse, and and um, two thirds of the people that are there may believe that she's partly to blame. And in fact, fourteen percent think they she asked for it. So that was pretty pretty distressing when you see that. Because of their economic de in, uh, dependence upon the perpetrator, at least this is the usual scenario, women who do leave and uh, try to stand on their own oftentimes have to turn to public assistance programs to get them started. And, and uh, you know, I think we're all aware of the fact that there's uh, politically and publicly, you know, uh, welfare recipients are, are you, uh, you know, looked down upon in our society. Um, uh, we blame uh, women on welfare for... Um, uh, their economic, their failure to be economically independent. We, there's questions about the individual's work ethics, uh, whether they deserve assistance or not, uh, those kinds of things. And so, again, blame when they turn for help to, to become independent. The CPS workers, the child protection workers, a lot of times hold the victims responsible for abuse in their families, or at least for protecting, uh, not necessarily for the abuse, but, but for protecting the children from exposure to further abuse. Um, and it's important, it's key to understand that in these situations, these uh, victims, well, they are victims. And so they don't have the strength and stamina at this point necessarily to be able to stand up and protect their, their children. And so CPS workers come in and, and uh, with the implied threat that they're going to remove children if uh, women go back to their batterer, which again is, you know, is... Uh, you know, part of the process for, for victims. Um, it, it just, again, you know, reinforces the sense that the victim is responsible for a lot of what's happening on uh, in these situations. Uh, back in 1976, uh, a person by the name of Rich coined this, uh, this as powerless responsibility, this notion that although she can do nothing about it, she's still responsible for it. And, and um, it's, it's key to understand that uh, women who try to leave abusive partners may place their own lives and the lives of their children at risk. When you go see a doctor, the doctor writes a prescription, tells you what to do, and if you do it, everything is fine, even if you're not getting better, because you're doing what the doctor said. But if you don't do what he said, if you're not compliant with medications, or you're not following the, I don't know, the exercise regimen that you were prescribed, or whatever, you're non-compliant, and, and um, whatever happens to you then is your own fault. And so, with medical personnel, uh, doctors may tell their their patients and treating them with domestic violence episodes that uh, they need to leave their husband and because the doctor said it therefore it is so and uh, so another area where and one reason why perhaps uh, victims a lot of times won't seek medical treatment is because of that um, the, the mandate to report domestic violence or intimate partner violence is uh, present in only six states as of the publication time of this text uh, it's an area that really we need some intervention. I think it should be mandatory, just like uh, just like child abuse reporting. Leaders in the, in the faith community also sometimes uh, may inadvertently or directly contribute to a sense of blame with victims. You know, there is a, a survey was taken in, a few years ago that said where most of the most of the individuals in the, in the faith communities believe that the victim shared part of the blame for what happened. Um, if she's looking at leaving and getting a divorce, that should be the last resort. And so that, as far as the faith is concerned, kind of uh, requires the victim to return to that relationship and make things better. Okay, slight interruption there, but I think I'm back. And uh, I know that I was finishing up the discussion about uh, attitudes of faith community leaders. 
um, sort of a you know a double-edged sword that uh, victims run into in dealing with with um, their their faith personnel, their faith individuals, because of the fact that um, on the one hand, uh, women are expected to preserve those those marriages and those relationships, and oftentimes when marriages fail, the uh, the unspoken share of responsibility is much greater on the, on the woman than it is on the male. But just because of these traditional notions that that women are the ones who are to maintain the emotional uh, life, the happiness of of the family. Uh, but by the same token, uh, if the uh, woman continues in this relationship and continues to subject herself to abuse and her children to that violent uh, environment, you know that this still makes the her blameworthy in their minds, and so it really is a very double-edged sword in dealing with uh, this particular community sometimes. Now, it's not to say that all all reverends and ministers and, and pastors and rabbis are, are like that, because that's not the case, um, but sometimes this is what we encounter. Um, so with all these individuals and systems around them, virtually everyone blaming her on one level or another for the abuse, it's not too surprising to find that victims often blame themselves. They buy into the notion that they have provoked the, uh, the violence or maybe if they just change their own behavior they could prevent it and that's that that false system of of uh, or false uh, ideas of control that we're going to talk about in a few moments there are all sorts of consequences violence affects people and changes them forever and the consequences of the violence includes things like uh, a, a fear of the offenders and the chronic anxiety that results from that as mentioned in an earlier slide you know the victims are never really f uh, free of fear of what what might happen if he comes back to to um, to haunt her once again. Studies indicate that women are significantly more fearful of intimate partner violence than men, and and uh, so this is one of the things that uh, we believe makes female I'm sorry male to female intimate partner violence qualitatively different and and uh, more of a serious concern. The, the uh, conditioning that goes on with chronic fear, of course, uh, causes all sorts of neurological alterations, as we've talked about at other points during the semester. And um, uh, it's really not unlike the kinds of injuries, neurological injuries, that are found among uh, soldiers, you know, dealing with roadside bombs in Iraq and Afghanistan. Chronic apprehension, impairments to thinking, um, depression, physical illness, all the results of the stress that results from from um, exposure to this kind of violence. Uh, there are trauma responses that are typical that include depression and aggression turning to substances. Um, victims often experience post-traumatic stress disorder which is characterized by disturbed sleep, uh, chronic and unexpected re-experiencing of the trauma, little cues, little things in an environment, sometimes simply smells are enough to uh, prompt memories, uh, recollections of the of the traumatic event and um, cause all sorts of problems in relationships. Um, easy startling, uh, numbing of responses uh, so that sometimes they're either overly sensitive or almost unresponsive to cues at different times. So so these are all kinds of things that are part of the post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and as as an individual is basically living in the survival part of the brain because of this conditioning, this neurological conditioning, um, the ability to solve problems is, is really very uh, limited in many respects. And this is one of the things that as we talk about uh, how males use this, uh, um, use the victims' problems as a way to uh, gain custody of the kids in the court system. We'll be talking about that a little bit later on. Uh, this is one of the things that they can use for this. They can they can show that uh, she make she makes bad decisions and she can't hold a job and all those kinds of things that might result of this from this. So the kinds of things he's doing to her sometimes he turns around and uses against her. Battered women have poorer health than others, higher body mass index, more cervical cancer, more disabilities, uh, take sick leave for longer periods of time at work have disturbed sleep patterns. While uh, men cause far more injuries and more severe injuries to women than to men when they do become violent, and I will add to this that men cause far more injuries and more severe injuries to women than women cause to men in uh, their own 
uh, female to male interpersonal violence. So we have a what's called a gendered pattern of injuries. The most common injury to uh, female victims includes brunt force trauma to the face and being strangled. Strangulation is something that's it's very common in, in these situations. Victims of male batterers suffer more complex fractures. Um, they have oftentimes more frequent orbital blowouts and the orbit is the uh, bone and uh, air structure, I guess, around the eyes more blowouts of the orbits and intracranial injuries and um, I think it's mentioned that doctors often fail to look for brain injuries when they're treating victims of domestic violence and it's, it's an area that should be a part of a routine examination I believe. So coping with violence diminishes the the um, um, the ability of the of the victim to come up with good strategies to um, to resolve the problems and and these strategies might go from a problem focused coping when when the victim has the least hopelessness you know to try to figure out what caused the abuse and and try to do things to change that now again that's a kind of a false sense of control but but nonetheless that's one thing she'll do or just uh, kind of placating and and um, resisting which is the least effective um, tool so something that is um uh, familiar to some of us is that what we we've heard of is a Stockholm syndrome, and this um, uh, talks about dynamics that uh, uh, involve how captors manipulate the their their hostages and how the hostage changes as a result of that manipulation. And and uh, apparently, and I, I should know this, I guess, but uh, there was an episode, I think, back in the 50s or 60s in Stockholm where where the the, uh, the hostages were later studied after they were freed from this extended experience with their captors. And because what happened was the hostages came out of it feeling very, very connected to their captors and apologizing for them and not wanting them to have anything done to them, even though they were held hostage for this long period of time. And what we find is, is that when an individual's survival is threatened um, and and threats uh, the the um, threats of kindness are kind of alternated with um, with or I'm sorry th threats to s the victim's safety are alternated with with kindness acts of kindness and things like this um, th the uh, hostages become emotionally dependent on those who have them subjugated. Uh, if you can imagine uh, being isolated and totally under the control of an individual and you know that individual at any moment may kill you, um, when that person doesn't do that, you're grateful. And every day you get becomes sort of a, an additional reason to be thankful and grateful to the captor who has this total power over you. And ultimately, you begin to feel a bond with the captor because the captor isn't doing those horrible things to you. And in fact, sometimes is doing some kind things for you, showing some acts of kindness. And, and so you can perhaps understand how it is that, an, that, a, that a hostage may become connected to a, a captor. And this is probably one reason why sometimes when you see episodes of individual soldiers in particular, maybe that have been taken by the other side and a few months later they're on television denouncing the United States. This has something to do with that most likely. Threats, of survi threats to survival and isolation are the most powerful antecedents for predicting development of the Stockholm Syndrome. Now what we think is, and a lot of individuals believe this in the field, that, that this is really what happens with victims of domestic violence. Remember they're feeling very very caught, very stuck um, captive in, in these situations themselves. They, they're trapped and they can't get out of this relationship. And so um, oftentimes they begin to feel stronger affections to their, to their abuser and apologize for him and take responsibility for his happiness um, and uh, don't acknowledge the abuse. In fact, deny the abuse occurred. And there, there are dynamics that are very similar between hostage situations and domestic violence or IPV violent, uh, victims. And so this is something that um, is, is probably one of the major contributors to an individual not leaving a situation. Um, trauma, trauma bonds are another, another area to look at. This is where um, there is behavior that's intermittently rewarded. 
Uh, and so there's this, this pattern of loving behaviors coupled with sporadic assaults. Um, and and this, this, this cycle uh, contributes to the victim's dependence on the abuser. And, and again, is another reason why the, the victim may stay. And we'll talk about that, that cycle in a moment. You can see that a little bit more in action. And the concept of learned helplessness, which basically, you know, once uh, once you become, uh, you're in a situation where you're out of control and, and can do nothing to affect change, when um, that situation repeats itself again, you, you just learn there's nothing you can do, and so all attempts to change things stop. And, and I would add, by the way, as the slide mentions, that the institutions in our society that are supposed to aid victims uh, sometimes cause more problems than, than offering solutions. And so this is another reason why uh, something else that contributes to this sense of learned helplessness with victims that have turned to the system previously and found that it wasn't effective. We'll talk more about that in the next uh, lecture. Victims think that they can focus on the batterer's happiness and they can change their own behaviors to to stop the abuse and this is that perceived control that is false. Um, victims uh, don't see that it is false and, and this is an area that in, in working with victims is, is probably one of those things to confront and, and try to help the victim understand she has no control in this situation. One study even suggested that none of a wife's behavior successfully suppressed the husband's violence once it began. And as I mentioned brain disorders, you know, all sorts of things neurologically occur with victims and, and also psychological disturbances are, are created, including um, uh, major depression. And this major depression is different from what we typically think of a depression where somebody may be sad and, you know, really not interested in things so much. Major depression is so powerful and overwhelming and is oftentimes caused by um, physical problems in the body is so overwhelming that the individual may not be able to even get the energy to get out of bed in the morning and um, you know loses interest in absolutely everything around her and uh, those that type of thing uh, suicide attempts are, are uh, common with people with major depression and if they can get up the energy to try to kill themselves at least and and um, um, you know the studies show that uh, Suicide attempts are four times more likely for female victims of intimate partner violence than the general population. So the studies indicate that this isn't something that just happens along with domestic violence or intimate personal, intimate person, intimate partner violence. It is something that the IPV actually causes the depression. And another, uh, so so um, this this is the results of some of the studies and. A PTSD is another frequent diagnosis that we find among female victims. And, and this is important. There is a significant correlation um, between the severity of the abuse and victims' ratings on psychopathology scales. You know, how severe the abuse is tends to contribute to uh, an increase in seriousness of psychopathology. And women who have been repeatedly engaged in abusive relationships and, and their there are those women that have a series of different relationships that are abusive. Um, they, they tend to fare the worst and have the highest levels of, of psychopathology. This is the cycle of violence that uh, I had referred to earlier and this is something that the Leisure Center uses and is, is fairly common uh, in, 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 in what I like about this, and there are different cycles, but what I like about this cycle is it's this very simple thing. There's three parts to it, three phases. Uh, the tension building phase, the explosion, and the honeymoon phase. And in the tension building phase, and this is generally the longest phase, uh, there may be some minor incidences of emotional or even some physical stuff going on, but, but for the most part, uh, things are okay, uh, but the victim can feel some tension, growing tension in, in their relationship and in the environment. Uh, and, and this is where she may be able to try to control any kind of negative outcome by I don't know, changing her behavior, getting the kids to behave differently, things like this, uh, being extra careful about what she cooks at night or being sure that the, the you know, the, the house is particularly clean and, and those kinds of things. Um, and she feels very much like she's walking on eggshells and it doesn't, you know, it's unpredictable when he comes in the door at night or for that matter, when she comes in the door at night, um, you know, we don't know how he's going to be. And, and if he is in a bad mood, we don't know why. And, Likewise, you know, sometimes you might come home and find him to be in a, just the happiest mood for no reason. But, but uh, of course, one we're worried about is when, when he's in a bad mood. And so, um, 
you know, she realizes she has no control over this because she doesn't understand what causes these mood swings. And so then suddenly the explosion occurs, something happens, maybe, maybe not, but the explosion occurs and there is this, this uh, serious battering episode. And, and um, the abuser seems to be totally out of control. And once this has occurred, um, the abuser then kind of backs off from that and becomes apologetic. The, the remorse that the batterer is feeling is not the kind of remorse that the typical person feels when they've done something wrong. It's, it's, it's much more superficial uh, and it's much, uh, much more passing. Uh, it, it is a short-lived remorsefulness, but during this period of time, the for whatever reason, the abuser seems to recognize uh, what he's done and he's going to go back and try to make things up and convince her that this isn't going to happen again. And so uh, flowers, candy, dinner out, dates, all sorts of things. Just this is the guy that she married. This is the man she fell in love with. Here he is again. And she is now convinced that this is the real person. She knew he was there. She didn't know where he went before, but now he's back. And, and she just needs to be different in the future to make sure that that other stuff doesn't happen again is what she's thinking. You know, and this is, of course, exactly what he's hoping she'll think. Um, it's, it's all very idealized and, and it's just such a romantic period. And over time, of course, this um, this kind of begins to settle into... Uh, more than norm again and suddenly we begin to find ourselves again in a situation where the victim is being pushed around a little bit and and walking on eggshells with him again and the cycle is has started again the whole thing that kind of powers this cycle that keeps it moving is the victim's denial this this uh failure to recognize that that what happened was abuse to begin with and and uh a failure to acknowledge that it's going to happen again if if uh, she doesn't get out of it and the only way really to to stop this cycle is for her to leave or him to leave and and to get out of this cycle but we also know all the dangers that are that are inherent in her leaving and so this is one of the reasons why um, this cycle is so captivating why it's it's such an entrapment for for the victim it isn't easy to get out of this cycle um, and and uh, the thing about this cycle is is that each time it happens you'll find that the explosion uh, becomes more severe um, eventually the honeymoon phase if it's going to get shorter and eventually disappear altogether as the cycle continues to repeat itself and the abuse becomes more severe and the cycle well the actually happens much more rapidly so what might have taken days or weeks before is now occurring sometimes within a matter of hours and so so you can see how um, the um, abuse uh, the ultimate outcome of this abuse is the death of the victim if this cycle is not interrupted just a couple of other things uh, before the end of this discussion and uh, about employment um, lack of financial resources is a serious dilemma for most battered women. Uh, begin with the batterers discourage women from working and and uh, oftentimes try to prevent them from working. And when they do work, um, they they'll show up at work and harass their victims, and this causes all sorts of problems for them at work. Uh, their employers hold them responsible for the batterers' behavior there as well, and and uh, so a lot of times they'll lose their jobs because of the disturbances that the batterers create, which is of course exactly what the batterers want because. First of all, um, he wants more control over her, and so the fewer relationships she has, the more control he has. Uh, if he hurts her, no one's going to see the injuries if she's not out there working. Uh, he doesn't want her to be independent, and if she's working, she may get her own money and begin to think that maybe she could live without him. Uh, and, and, and really, just when you think about traditional masculine socialization, you know, and this batter is probably hyper-masculine in this respect, he doesn't need a woman bringing money into the household. This is his job to take to take care of the family. And even if he's doing a crappy job of, of providing an income, it's his job, not hers. And, and uh, it's an insult to his masculinity for her to be out there earning money. But the result of this, of course, is that women that want to leave abusive relationships sometimes don't have the financial resources to support their kids without relying on the abuser. And so they'll 
oftentimes seek welfare uh, when they do leave and and um, that of course leads to all those other problems we've spoken about earlier and there isn't adequate child care out there a lot of times welfare recipients don't have adequate transportation and if they do get jobs the jobs they get may even give them minimum wage but not what we call a living wage uh, that is a salary where a woman can uh, can actually support herself and kids and so it's really um, Employment and income is, is one of the major areas of concern that causes women to stay in relationships and uh, that are abusive. A few moments just to talk about male victims of intimate partner violence. Uh, back in the 1970s, I believe a psychologist by the name of Suzanne Steinmetz um, did a study and argued that men suffer from battered husband syndrome sometimes. And um, this text doesn't really talk about battered woman syndrome or battered wife syndrome, but this is um, basically a kind of a combination of all the symptoms we were talking about, a little bit of the Stockholm syndrome and learned helplessness and, and uh, the trauma bonds and all those kinds of things that are kind of combined that prevent women from taking the steps they need to take to protect themselves and others around them. And, and Steinmetz said the same thing happens with men. And uh, just to show you a little bit about how, you know, political this this whole discussion can be you know the the field the individuals in the field really uh were very upset with her and, and she became something of a, of a pariah i believe in, in her field for some time because of this study and you know there have been lots of studies since that uh, some studies uh, that conclude that men and women batter with equal frequency but but most of the sources of data clearly establish that women comprise the vast majority of victims and are the ones who are most severely injured and damaged by any abuse that occurs um, one study concluded that injured men were likely to to be batterers injured while committing battery. In fact, um, and and uh, when, this is a you know this is sort of a hot topic. You know that well, sometimes when um, police do go out and make arrests in domestic violence cases, we find women being arrested, and and a lot of times those women were actually defending themselves, but uh, left marks that the batterers didn't leave. Um, other studies point to the presence of male victims of both female and male intimate partner violence. So there is no doubt that there are some male victims. But again, you know, this is really this intimate partner violence is much more an issue for women um, as victims than it is for males as victims uh, for a number of reasons that we've already talked about. Um, and another another uh, study indicated that males identified as victims in one episode uh, are likely to be identified as perpetrators in the next episode. So so again, it's it is um, uh, you know the 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 notion of male victims and the frequency of male victims out there. There's a lot of stuff about that dynamic that needs to be understood before we begin to say that this is an equal or an, a not gendered issue. Uh, there, so. Anyway, that uh, that will conclude this particular part of the lecture. Um, after you're done with this, I'd take a break and get a cup of coffee and come back and listen to the second half. And we'll pick up on this topic from there. <laughs>